I think we've come a long way, but historically, from a student point of view, Berkeley has been a huge bureaucratic factory. And the offices that students have had to deal with, whether it's LNS advising or financial aid or the library uh, paying your fines or getting your library, all those things was like one after another going into your know, multiple uh, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles offices. <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, that's my analogy, right? That's horrible. That's horrible. That's horrible. That's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> but that, you know, and I think we've come a long way. I don't think we're all the way there yet. Actually, the but if you might think back, you know, to, to back to the sort of, um, you know, the 60s when I was a graduate student here. I mean, and uh, there were two sort of defining things about the student experience here which gave birth to the uh, free speech movement, aside from the specifics of it. One was Claude Kerr's Uses of the Multiversity, which was read by students as a book about a educational factory in which the students were being churned out as units, work units for society. Big and personal piece of uh, factory. And the other was a slogan of the FSM movement. Don't fold, spindle, or mutilate me. And if you remember what that was, that was written on every IBM card. Right, 80 right? Columns. 80 columns. Right, right? Yeah. And that was what, how st in those days, that's the way students thought about their experience here. Now, I think we've come a long way from that, but we are a large place. And students do have to deal with our various bureaucratic agencies. And I think it's a really tough thing to turn those folks who are doing that into service providers rather than control agents. Mm -hmm. rule, uh, rule enforcers. Yeah, rule enforcers, right. Well, campus culture is as resistant to change as any place I've ever been. Uh, not because uh, people don't want to individually change, uh, they just want to be able to make their own decisions around those changes, and the culture supports that. So when we're talking about making a change as an institution, right, this is an undertaking which we just cannot underestimate. Um, it took uh, a couple of, of reflections for me after the fact to, to understand uh, why some of that is. So I wanted to just uh, share those with you. Uh, the first was that when we made the change in the organization, uh, it was very, very personal for every individual. They believed that the reason I was making the change was to somehow personally negatively impact them. Right? Even the people that were greatly advantaged by the changes believed it was somehow a personal attack unless, because so, I changed something without allowing them to make their own decision around the change. So I had to work with those individuals, I mean, 400 people, and every single one of them believed, not that what we were doing at a macro level was necessarily bad, but for them individually, this was a bad thing. Even if they were advantaged. Even if they were advantaged, because they didn't get to decide whether they got to opt into that change or not by virtue of it being somehow imposed on them. That imposition was negative. Now, I just couldn't understand that when I went through the process, but I knew that retreat rights would kill us. Right? I just, so even as everybody was coming at me and I was trying to understand why they all, it was really cognitive dissonance for me. I just couldn't understand why they thought, you know, you just got a, a better job and a better opportunity doing new things that you said you wanted to do. So why are you in here telling me that this is a really bad thing? And, and yet if I retreated, if I said, okay, we'll, we'll make some changes for you, I would have had to have done that for 400 people. So. It was very, very hard at, at, a, at a level that I just didn't understand with the individuals. Then taking it up a notch, one of the reasons that occurred to me even later on was because their jobs were based not on process or simply on skill, but actually based on relationships. They based their success of their day-to-day -day work on the relationships that they had developed, including those which they got to avoid and those that which they got to enhance, regardless of the need of the job that they were in. So the relationship aspect turned out to be the piece that we can't control. We don't, doesn't matter what we decide, those relationships are individual, they have been developed over a long period of time, and we will break them with the changes that we're going to make in a way that you just can't possibly predict. 
uh, I had resignations over relationship breakage. I, you know, if I don't get to work with so-and-so, I'm leaving. Right? Uh, you know, Graham just mentioned, you know, performance reviews. You mean you're going to hold me accountable to a written performance review? That's offensive to me. I'm leaving. I mean, you know, people just, the, the level of anxiety was something I couldn't understand, but the relationship aspect became very important. Then again, from the opposite direction, which is our campus community as customers of our services, the relationships to deliver those services, right, were broken. And so then the customers are reinforcing the fact that the changes that you are making are bad because they have, through time and tested technique, honed their ability to get something done through relationships, no matter how circuitous, no matter how inappropriate, no matter how misaligned with the way you're trying to optimize the organization, the relationships are how things get done. So I had assistant vice chancellors, I had deans, I had department chairs, I had all kinds of people that would schedule time with me to let me know that what I was doing was wrong, I was going to hurt their ability to get things done, that, that I didn't understand the way things worked because Jane was no longer gonna be working with Bob. And that's how things got done. And in fact, they were right. When we made the changes, things stopped working because that's how everything works. But if the way things work is through relationships, you cannot optimize relationships as an organization. You, you can't, we at this table cannot control that. So I think the relationship aspect uh, is, is the hardest thing we're gonna face. And it ended up being that you have to go through the valley of despair. You've gotta go through that desert of challenge, recognizing that you've stripped the relationships away, not intentionally, that's just what ends up happening. And you have to replace them with process. Predictable, repeatable, improvable processes. Those take time. They, they don't work right away. Stuff doesn't always go smoothly. And oh, by the way, they didn't go smoothly with relationships either. But when those didn't go smoothly, people gave the distance to, and the trust to be able to say, oh, I know you really screwed that up, but it's okay, Bob. We've worked together. I know you'll get it fixed for me. When a process doesn't work for them, the whole world is, 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 is a flame, right? Everything is bad. So getting past that valley of despair to the point where you can identify that the, that the problem isn't with the broken relationship anymore. The problem was a, with, is with a process that needs to be improved. Then you can really start to see the gears moving faster. You fix that and you tune that process. You empower people to say, you own that process. Your job is to improve that process. And when they do and things start working, then those are your spot awards. Then those are your recognitions. Not because Jane in Department A says that Bob is the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Which is how we gave spot awards before, which is how we compensated people before, which is because they get the psychic reward of saying, I'm the most valuable person in the world to this individual, whether that actually works or not. What you're talking about is corporatizing the process, the, the, the structure, and that is, gets an enormous amount of resistance, never mind well, the rest of what, what you said. said. There is a vast organization theory literature, which amongst other things has a consensus on one thing, that every organization is a formal and a human organization. You're not going to eliminate human relationships, but functional organizations are ones in which the human relationships are aligned with the formal relationships. Not that they eliminate them. 